we're going to talk a little bit about propagation and basically what what it is when we when we say say something about propagation. What do we mean? Okay. You know what? I think you guys can see this better if I turn the lights out. There you go. That's probably good. Yeah. Okay. So this is how this is how radio waves work. You can see. Uh, see the two antennas there on the bottom, and the radio waves. And if you notice, they go to the, they go up, hit the black line, and come down and hit the earth. And that's the way it, that's the way it works. Uh, the only Reliable, reliable uh, uh, communications line of sight. Two antennas can see each other, basically. And uh, uh, but when you get past that, you get into the curvature of the Earth and everything else. The the, the radio wave got to do something. And this is this is this is how the, this is how it works. Uh, Lower, lower frequencies between 30 and 3,000 kilohertz uh, travel in surface waves following the contour of the Earth. That's our VHF uh, low band. Uh, and they just kind of follow, follow the curvature of the Earth until there's no signal to be, to be seen. Uh, there are hundreds of uh, places on the Internet that you can go and get Propagation figures. Uh, most of them will confuse the Dickens out of you. Uh, the only one I use is WWV and, and ARRL. 18 minutes past the hour on WWV, they give a propagation report. And all they're going to tell you is sunspot numbers, the average uh, solar flux, which is what you need to think about. Uh, right now, I looked at the, I looked at the propagation forecast for the month, and field day weekend the average solar flux is supposed to be 200, which means if you had a 10 meter walkie talkie, you ought to be able to walk the world on a, on that 10 meter walkie talkie, because the the atmosphere is going to be so good that long distance communications ought to be fantastic. That's if we don't have a solar flare. Uh, so, all right. This gives you another another diagram of, of how we talk around the other the, the other side of the world. Transmit antenna goes out and hits the atmosphere, and it's not reflected. Okay, don't use that term. It's not reflected. It reflects something. It comes back 180 degrees difference. Well, if you do that with a radio signal, you're going to wipe it out because it's going to combine with the other half of that and just be, be uh, wiped out, just cancel each other out. Uh, same thing with audio. So important that when you run an audio, audio microphones and everything, they're all wired the same because if you got one that's wired. 180 degrees out, it's going to screw up the whole thing. So it comes back, it's, re re it's refracted, and if you want to know what refraction is, you get your glass of water, put your straw down in it, and as soon as you look down that straw, you can see that straw look like it's bent. That's refraction. Uh, it comes back, and again, off the uh, in CB terms, First skip zone, second skip zone, third skip zone. Okay? And it'll do that all the way around the earth until each time it hits the earth, it takes a little bit of a little bit of energy out of that signal. So you can get that's why guys with big amplifiers can talk to the nether regions on the other side of the earth a whole lot better than you guys with a hundred watts can, because your signal's gonna die before it gets there. So that's 2 to 30 megahertz. Now, not all of those frequencies are act like that. 
and the atmosphere, the, uh, the ionosphere gets kind of squirrely. Uh, some of you six meter people have heard about, uh, have heard about sporadic heating. Well, that's what happens. You get one little spot in the atmosphere that gets excited for some reason by the sun and it'll appear and, and in the lower, in the lower, that's the E region, which is a lower region in the, in the, in the uh, ionosphere. And allow allow 50 megahertz to 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 go further. Uh, some some of it you can see gets up there between the F and the and the, and the E layer and kind of ducks and all kinds of. That's why that's why I say there's not a whole lot you can do about propagation. You can change the angle of you know if you've got this stuff to do it you can change the angle of take off from your antenna uh, and stuff like that, but that's still not much you can do about propagation. <clears throat> Solar flares. I put this in here as an afterthought. Measure uh, why solar, flare, solar flares uh, Affect propagation. Uh, it's electric, electromagnetic radiation that originates from a sunspot cycle, sunspot area, and it throws out a, a uh, uh, solar flare of this high energy from the sun, magnetic energy from the sun. Uh, and those those flares are classified X, M, C, B, and A. A is the, the weakest. X is the strongest. The flare that we're under right now was an M-class flare, and they're they're uh, designated like an M1, M2, M3 up to M9. Then it goes into the next flare, and they're if the X flares. They don't have any numbers. They don't have a. They go to infinity. They don't have. That, that, they just don't think they'll ever get anything stronger than that. But they just don't have any end of the numbers. Uh, and each one of them is ten times stronger than the other. So an M-class flare is ten times stronger than what was the one below that C flare, and an X flare is ten times stronger than an M flare. So that's that's what solar flares do to the atmosphere, and what it does it excites the atmosphere, and we'll get a I've got a diagram here of the uh, somewhere. This is a bunch of uh, scientific jargon that I can't, I don't understand. So we're not even going to talk about it. All right, let's let's talk about these. This is what this is what we need to know. Uh, these are the four layers. Well, actually, actually three layers uh, of the atmosphere. The D layer. Which is uh, absorbed uh, most radio waves during the day. So uh, 80 and 40 aren't very good during the day in most cases, uh, and that's why because they they get absorbed by the D layer. Now at night the D layer is very active, and that's why at night 80 and 40 become uh, good good DX bands, good good communication bands. The uh, the E layer uh, depends on how excited the atmosphere gets, but the E layer at daytime is a good long distance, and it'll take 10, 15, uh, 20, and 15 probably, maybe uh, 17 meters uh, work on the D layer. Uh, and then we get up to the F layer. Now, if you see up there, you got F1 and F2. During the day, uh, during the high sunspot cycle, like we're in now, the peak is supposed to be next year. Uh, it actually will allow it will allow the higher frequencies to uh, the E layer will allow will allow it will fade out enough that it will allow these signals to go through the E layer 
and then depending upon which of these and what frequency, uh, it'll, it'll refract it back, and that's when you get your real long distance, 10 meters around the world, and they're coming because they have two layer. At night, they all disappear, and all you have is the E layer and the, and the F layer. And that's why when the F layer is suitably excited, you can talk around 20. I mean, it's not nearly as, as strong as it is during the day, but it will still stay open all night long. That's why field day is so much fun, because if you're on 20 meters or 15 meters, uh, you can go all night long. 10 meters will go, go for a good while. Uh, so, uh, in a, in a high in a, in, in the, a high sunspot cycle, uh, I used to run the uh, international DX contest in February in March, and that's what I used to do. I used to run around 20 meters, 40 meters, up until around 10:30, 11 o'clock at night. Then I go to 10 meters and start calling CQ and the Japanese would just drop all over me. All the all the Far East would just just be there. I'd make six, seven hundred contacts just out of the Far East, and uh, and that's on ten meters at midnight, two, three o'clock in the morning. So it's uh, that's propagation. Okay. So what do I know about propagation? Well, when you pick up the 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 average solar flux, which is what you'll pick up. If you go to ARRL, you can sign up for their propagation report, and it comes out about every two weeks. And it usually covers uh, the month, four or five weeks. Now, of course, the, the stuff in the future is all based <laughs> on information they've had stored in computers for years. But it gives you an idea. Uh, if you get on there and you look and it says July the 15th, the, the average solar flux is 40, you can forget it, okay? If it says the average solar flux is 150, then you're gonna, probably going to have good communication. Anything over 100 is good communication. So uh, that's, about, that's about all that you really need to know about propagation. You just got to... <coughs> And you, like I said, you get on the internet and you can find uh, probably as many as you want to look at uh, people that have propagation reports out there. And uh, they'll all pretty much have the same average solar flux numbers. But when you get to the K index and the A index, it depends on where they are as to what those numbers will be. Uh, the, the numbers that come out, the numbers that come out of, uh, the numbers that come out of uh, WWV come from around Fort Collins, the middle of the country. Mm -hmm. And those numbers, A, K and A index, those numbers will be different than somebody up in Montana and, and Canada and places like that are down south. Their numbers will be different because that's the A to K index is more or less reading the magnetic condition of the earth and it's mainly noise when those numbers are high you're going to have a lot of noise on the bands uh, so the ideal day would be average solar flux around around 180 to 200 and the A and K index down in four, with numbers of 1, 2, 3 or 4 somewhere in that center you, made it, you ought to have really good nice fairly quiet good communications so <clears throat> That's basically all there is about propagation. Uh, all right, thank, other, thank you. <laughs> there's a lot of other. It kind of gives you an idea of what the uh, uh, the the first the, the first refraction zone. It's called considered skyway. In other words, it's not hit the earth. You're catching it in the sky. Right. Then you see ground wave. Ground wave is only good for well. Depending on what frequency you're on, say 40 meters, probably good for about 40, 50 miles. Uh, and then you can see how at night it comes into the E layer and the F layer, and then during the day, during the day you have uh, all 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 four layers, the F F1 and F2. And uh, 
anything below anything below 10 megahertz <coughs> is what the D layer affects. Uh, during the day, when it uh, when it dies out, uh, it absorbs pretty much anything under 10 megahertz. So that's why your daytime communications on 40 and 80, you know, 80 about 8 o'clock in the morning starts going to 50, going to pop. Uh, so uh, then you have to go above 10, 10 megahertz. <coughs> and they'll give you, a, some of them will give you a, 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 a reading of a frequency. And they'll tell you that the uh, MUF is above 20 megahertz, 20, uh, 20 kilohertz or 30 kilohertz or whatever. And MUF is maximum usable frequency. So anything above whatever that number is is pretty much unusable. And that's, that's another thing you might find on some of these other uh, uh, places that give you uh, propagation reports. Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't listened. I haven't listened in on WWB in a while, so I'm not sure what they, what all they give you, if they give that to you or not. Because uh, I'm, I'm not a DXer. I don't do BX anymore, so I really, really don't care. Uh, and that uh, and this is this again. This is just a. The, uh, to tell you what the height, like, you know, everything's gone metric. And I guess one of these days I'm going to have to sit down and learn all the formulas to convert it to, to, to uh, miles. Uh, but, you know, in Australia, when they talk in Australia, I've got a YouTube channel I watch a lot. The guy's a machinist. And he always deals in in uh, metric numbers. Occasionally, he'll get something in that a drawing or something that will have uh, U.S. inches and feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he just says whenever he talks about it, he calls them bananas. So I don't know why I told you that. Just a piece of trivia. All right, that's 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 that. Now I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna try to I'm try to play you a, a video here that might that might uh, help you understand it a little bit more. All right, I gotta find it. This video I've titled Radio Propagation 101. It will give you a basic understanding of radio propagation. As ham radio operators, we've all seen propagation reports like this. But what do they really mean? High frequency radio propagation depends on many factors. To begin to understand it, we need to know about the ionosphere and how current solar conditions affect it. The sun not only makes life possible on Earth, it makes long distance radio propagation possible too. Solar radiation does interesting things to the upper regions of the atmosphere. Dark regions on the solar surface or sunspots are responsible for increased magnetic radiation from the sun. This radiation is what gives the ionosphere its ions, which refracts certain radio waves and absorbs others. Sunspots can vary from day to day, but they also tend to follow an 11 year cycle of activity. During peaks in the sunspot number, even very low power stations can often be heard around the world. Sunspot numbers can also vary on a 27 day cycle due to the rotation of the sun. Of course, the tilting of the Earth on its axis affects propagation too, as well as the time of day. As a very general rule of thumb, frequencies above 10 MHz are useful during the day and below that are good at night. Predicting the actual usable frequency is an art and a science and depends on many factors. Another thing that affects propagation are solar flares, which eject massive amounts of potential and electromagnetic energy over a very wide spectrum. Flares occur near sunspots and often last only a minute or two. Flares are classified by the amount of x-rays that they produce. The biggest flares are x-class flares. M-class flares have a tenth of the energy of an x-class flare, and c-class flares have a tenth of the energy of an m-class flare. Though often short, 
in duration the effects they have on the ionosphere and radio communications can last for days. The ionosphere refracts radio waves of specific frequencies, primarily high frequencies, 3 to 30 megahertz. It is this refraction of radio energy that makes worldwide radio communications possible without the aid of a satellite. There are three basic layers in the ionosphere. The D layer is responsible for absorbing radio frequencies, not refracting. The more the D layer is ionized, the more it absorbs radio energy. Frequencies above 10 MHz are not readily absorbed by the D layer, but lower bands are usually unusable for long distance communications during the daytime thanks to the D layer. Like the D layer, the E layer dissipates its energy quickly when the sun is not shining, and therefore is only a major factor during the day. However, unlike the D layer, which absorbs the lower HF spectrum and lets higher frequencies pass through it, the E layer can refract radio signals, cause them to skip back to Earth. At night, when the E layer is very weak, radio signals tend to pass right through it. F1 and F2 are jointly called the F region. In fact, they combine into one F layer at night. The F region is the most important for long distance HF radio communications. It retains its ions longer than any other layer and remains ionized all night, although not as densely. Its intense daytime ionization refracts high frequencies, but at night will often let them pass through. Low frequencies below 10 to 15 megahertz are refracted back to earth at night. At night, the D layer disappears and the E layer becomes very weak since it can't stay ionized very long. Also, F1 and F2 combine to create a single layer. Low frequencies are now useful since the D layer is no longer there to absorb them. This is why you hear AM radio stations from all over the country at night. The same higher frequencies that are useful during the day may pass right through these less strong night side F regions. The highest frequency that will be refracted by the F region is the maximum usable frequency. It is often a good idea to use a wavelength close to the maximum usable frequency, but lower frequencies may be more prone to absorption and get degraded. Sometimes the maximum usable frequency drops below 5 MHz, or so due to the disturbance or weakened F region. Solar flares can cause such disturbances. Low points on the sunspot cycle don't help either. Current conditions in the atmosphere will greatly affect how radio signals of different frequencies will propagate. Sunspots help increase the atmosphere's ability to refract HF radio waves, while flares can cause disturbances in the ionosphere, known as geometric storms. A disturbance in the ionosphere will do more to absorb HF radio signals than propagate them. Higher sunspot numbers indicate increased ionizing radiation from the sun which enhances the ionosphere's ability to refract HF signals. The sunspot number can vary from 0 to over 200 during the peak of the 11 year solar cycle. Similar to the sunspot number, the solar flux value is actually a measurement of radio signal from the sun. This index taken once a day at a frequency of 2800 MHz. Increased radio noise from the sun means more ionizing radiation and correlates with the sunspot number. Solar flux values range from 60 to 300. The K index is a code that relates to the maximum fluctuation of horizontal components observed on a magnetometer relative to a quiet day during a three hour interval. The conversion table for maximum fluctuation K index varies from observatory to observatory in such a way that the historical rate of occurrence of certain levels of K are about the same at all observatories. In practice this means that observatories at higher geomagnetic latitudes require higher levels of fluctuation for a given K index. There is a relationship between K and A. The A index was invented because there was a need to derive some kind of daily average level of geomagnetic activity. Because of the nonlinear relationship of the K scale to magnetometer fluctuation, it is not meaningful to take an average of a set of K indexes. What is done instead is to convert each K back into a linear scale called an equivalent hourly range A index. The daily A index is merely an average of 8A indexes. 
Now here's some math. If we take the K indexes for the day, the daily E index is the average of the equivalent amplitudes. For example, 3 is equal to 15, 4 is equal to 27, 6 is equal to 80, 5 is equal to 48, and so on. So we take these numbers and we add them together. Divide by 8, we end up with 25.25, which gives us our A index for the day. Now that you have a basic understanding of how space weather works, the website I like to go to is Space Weather Prediction Center at www.swpc.noaa.gov. Good DXing! N73s from N9 LVS. Alright, so as you can see, or as you heard, I should say, uh, the, uh, there's a lot of math in there and a lot of measurements that you can't measure. And like it, like they said, it comes from several different places and they add it all together to get the average. So I don't even listen, I don't care about the A and the K index. I want to know what the average solar flux is. That's my, that's my indicator as to what bands I can probably get on and talk and have fun if I'm chasing the X where it might be. But you got to realize, and it's sunny over the United States. The other side of the world is in darkness. So their propagation is going to be totally different than ours. And that, that and we get into, that's for another class. Uh, but you get into the gray line and all that good stuff as, it, as, as the gray line moves across the earth. And that's when you can probably get better communications into some places because it's just, they're just, they're just coming out of the gray line and we're just going into it, so the propagation is very similar. So that's propagation. My second, to round out, to round out, well, I'm going to leave it up there. I'm going to, I'm going to give you, a, I got a PowerPoint that I, uh, that I, we're going to look at. Uh, where am I? Where am I? Okay. All right. Why well, did you? Oh, there it comes. Okay, it took a while. Uh, I got in on this after our program last last month. I, mean, uh, I forget who the guy was that did it. Fred. Fred Miller. Fred. Yeah. Did a good job. Uh, and uh, I just want to reinforce kind of what what he what he talked about to give you a little bit more information about vertical antennas. So we're going to, because I've got vertical antennas, I've got vertical antennas that I've used in the field on field day from 10 meters to 80. Uh, so this is a very simple vertical antenna. Uh, the antenna you use on your car for two meters and full 40, or that antenna right there. They're quarter wavelength, uh, and the, the coax goes to, center conductor goes to the uh, antenna, and the shield goes to ground. Ground is the other half of that an antenna. Vertical antenna is only half of a dipole. The other half is the ground, okay? Here we have the same thing, you can see, drive the ground rod to get a good ground. Now that works good on 80, fairly good on 40, but when you get above 40 meters, you really need to go to a radial system you know, over here in this side. Uh, as, as they talked about on the last month, they put up four radials, uh, and they just, all of a sudden the band just opened up to them and they had a, a grand time making contact. And uh, they elevated it off the ground. Elevating it off the ground has more to do with the uh, uh, impedance of the antenna and coax connection more, more than anything else. So uh, that's why, and, and I, 
he did he said four radials is enough well I've played around enough with these things to realize that if you if you make a a vertical antenna with four radials and you get the SWR down as far as you can can get it uh, you know 1.5 something like that add a few more radials and see what happens to the, to the, to the SWR It'll gradually start coming down. Now your frequency will also change a little bit. So you may have to adjust the length of the uh, uh, antenna to, to tune it a little bit. So uh, on my 80 meter, which is a 65, which is a 50 foot uh, fiberglass mast with a wire run down the middle of it, uh, I use about 16, 16 radios. And, uh, What's their length? Huh? What's their approximate length? They're quarter wavelength. Quarter wavelength. Yeah. Because it's got to be the other. They're, they're actually acting as the other side of the, of the dipole. All antennas are dipoles. I don't care what configuration they're in, they're dipoles. You got a transmitting, then you got some sort of other side of it. And because of the voltage distribution and so forth and so on. That's another class. Uh, so, uh, the more I, I say this, the more radios you put down, the better the uh, input peaks of that antenna is going to be. Uh, this is a uh, <coughs> this is a diagram of uh, the uh, of the. Uh, uh, vertical pattern of between a quarter wave, a half wave, and a five eighths wave antenna. So you see that the, the uh, quarter wave uh, is the shortest pattern of, of all. Now I have not played, and I, I in doing the research for this class, I read I read beyond what I wanted to know. If that makes any sense, uh, if I came across an article on that stuff, I read, and if it an if it answered my question within the first five sentences, that's as far as I went. I didn't have any reason to go any further because it answered answered my question. So, in researching this, I decided to read the other fifteen or twenty sentences. And so that's uh, after after reading that, I said, hey, you know, I had just. Uh, I need to get out there with my 15 meter antenna and add some more sections to it and, and see what see what the difference is. I haven't done it yet, but that's something I want to may want to do. And I, I'm going to show you a little bit of that here in a minute. Uh, so on two meters, if you're if you're having a single band antenna, what's what's the, what's usually the two that are sold? Used to you have got a quarter way. Or you got a five eighths wave, okay? And the five eighths wave, according to this, the reason that is because it went like this, where the quarter wave kind of went this far, okay? And that has to do with the antenna, with the radiation pattern of the antenna. So obviously, a five eighths wave. Now, if you kind of hard to do a five eighths wave on eighty meters, that would be about. Uh, Probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 180 feet tall. So you could hardly do it on 80 meters, but you could certainly do it on 20, 15, and 10. Probably 42. And these don't take a lot of space. See, that's another another reason why they're good for field day, because you don't have to worry, do I have two trees I can stretch an antenna between? You know, as long as you've got a space big enough around to stick it straight up. You're good. This is an elevated. This is the elevated uh, uh, vertical that they they used for 20 meters last year. And uh, all antennas, the the, the uh, height above ground uh, affects the pattern of the antenna. And so, uh, if you read about that. And all I'm going to tell you, the lowest you ought to have an antenna is a quarter wavelength above ground. That's going to give you the best pattern 
Okay, if you go down lower, it's going to really distort the pattern. And if you go up higher, it's going to make the pattern different, but not necessarily uh, uh, bad. It could get better. Angle of radiation could drop, so forth and so on. So uh, height above ground is important. It's not, as I said, a quarter wavelength is the, and I believe they had that antenna on top of a 12-foot uh, 2x4. And so actually it should have been, if on 20 meters, it should have been about, it should have been up around 16 feet to be, to be a quarter wavelength. All right, here is a, here is a way for single band operation to tune the antenna. Okay, and over here is, if you're going to do it multiband, then you use a little bit different configuration of the tuning coil. And, <clears throat> That's what they're talking about. Hmm. Okay? And then we're going to talk about this here in a, in a little bit. <clears throat> All right. Uh, All right, this is uh, this is this is three vertical antennas laid out. The one on the very left hand is a 40 meter, the uh, one in the middle is a 20 meter, and the one on the outside out there is a 15 meter. So they're all ready, they're marked, you can see the paint, paint markings on the uh, 20 and the 15, so you can slide them together with a clothes clamp, it's ready to go. And uh, I use a, uh, all right, where Found that in the ground. Strap it. Strap this to it. And oh, there it is. And then this particular antenna that I just <laughs> screw it in there, and then I add whatever sections on this to get to whatever band that I want. Okay. So that's. Just that's simple, easy to easy to put up, and I use a couple. Of, use, I use a couple of hose clamps. And he, would, he would have to walk all the way around the other way. There it is. And I just strap, strap. This is where. I, this is the ground side. That's where I put my radials out. This thing is made to where I could take this. So for instance, I didn't want to go to 80 meters. I had a nice tall tree and I could put a 60 foot wire up in the tree and I can take and hook the wire into that and still use this coil to tune the, tune the antenna. Can you explain that a little bit more? That tuning that coil. Uh, well, all you're doing, all you're doing. What are we? What are we adjusting? The SWR. Or the yes. Okay. Yes. You're you're trying to get this down to where to 50 ohms right here. So these things here are a little. They're little clamps, and you just loosen them and take. If you you can see the indentions of the wire. These are indented, so you can go every other and clamp it to it like this oh, okay. and uh, do that to, to uh, because you can't well I'm not going to say you can't you can you can measure like for instance if I were to use if I were to use all these to to make a, to make a, a vertical antenna in here uh, these things screw together like so but each one of these long ones is three feet. The short ones are about uh, 20 inches. So I don't have any way to physically get exactly on a half wavelength or a quarter wavelength. So I would use my I would use my remote automatic antenna tuner instead of that coil, which is basically the same thing. It's just done automatically, and I would make this up, tune it, and just let it go. Uh, all this stuff is 
military surplus. And uh, since I use these kind of antennas in the Army, when I found them on eBay as, you know, people trying to sell them, RC-292 is the military designation for the antenna I got all these from. That and guy wire, uh, tensioners for the guy wire, all that came out of military surplus. But none of those are military surplus. Those were all aluminum tubes that I bought from Home Depot or somebody. I've had those probably 20 <coughs> years. And I've used them in, I've used them on field days many times. And uh, when I was holding field day out at the Navy base, uh, I had two trees right there where my, I set my tent up that were perfect. I could string uh, 10, 15, and 20 meter dipole between these two trees. And so <clears throat> one year I decided, I'm gonna, I've got these verticals, I'm going to try them out. So I strung the dipole, and in the middle of the night when everything kind of slowed down a little bit to where I could get a hold of a station that was willing to talk in a few minutes to where I could switch between antennas, I found there was absolutely no difference between dipole up 60 feet, up out 40, 20 to, 20 to 40 feet, and the uh, vertical mounted on the ground with the radio. Matter of fact, I found out that when I got a real DX station, because I, I, uh, con I worked a station in Hawaii, and uh, he let, I said, okay, you got a minute, let me switch antennas. Well, he dropped, he dropped, I was on the, uh, I was on, I was on the dipole when I contacted him, and when I switched him over to the vertical, his signal came up 3 dB. And that's not because that gain, uh, that, I mean that vertical had gain, it was because of the pattern of that vertical. Probably the angle of radiation was down in such a way that, that uh, it was a better signal. And I said, well, that's pretty good. Well, the very next station I contacted was a guy in Puerto Rico. We did the same thing with him. And uh, it, the very same situation. I don't think he finally, I don't think he quite went up 3 dB, but he did, his signal did go up, the difference between the dipole and the vertical. So the vertical's a good antenna. And it's easy to put up. Even a 40, even a 40 meter, it's a quarter wave weight from 40 meters, around 32 feet. Okay. So even even 30 feet, you don't have to guide that. Now on my 80 meter, when it goes up 50 feet, I have to guide it. Uh, and I didn't bring that up here. That's too much stuff to bring. I'll probably bring it if they let me do it. I'm gonna do a class on vertical antennas at field day. If they if the the powers to be are uh, agreeable. And I'm going to bring all this out and they need to see it all. Uh, and we, we, depending on how many people are interested and how many people want to work, we may put the 80 meter up. I don't know. But we're definitely going to, I'm definitely going to put a 215 meter one. And we're going to talk, we're going to talk about uh, the fact that we can put multiple antennas up and hook them together and uh, that's the 15 meter antenna but you hook them together and by, by using pieces of coax cut to a quarter wavelength we can phase those two antennas and we can actually we can actually rotate them so they can say well we're going this way well we need to go this way so now we can by adding or subtracting or by adding a, a quarter wave stub to one of the antennas, the other we can actually make the antenna transmit that way. So, but we'll talk about that another time. That's the 15 meter antenna, and a lot of this stuff is old, busted <coughs> antenna parts. Uh, back when the store was Memphis Amateur was here, they get a guy bring in a busted antenna, and I take the stuff home. I figure I can make something out of it. Most of the, you see the. The base of that one and the base of that one are all from a, some sort of vertical that was either damaged in shipping or something. Uh, and that's a 20 meter antenna. It's got one more length of, of uh, uh, 
uh, aluminum, the, the 15, and then there's the there's the 40, and it's got several more. But the run of the reason it's got several more is I I put the, the, the when I join them I put down in there a little more to give that joint a little more strength. So it's just going to be 32 feet. Actually, I don't when I when I put this one up I usually put it up as long as I can get it. And then with my tuner and everything, I, I can even tune 80 meters on it. And uh, so I've used that a lot uh, in the middle of the night on 40 and 80. So, so that's here's a 15 meter kit. Uh, the three, those are those are four, right at four foot mass fiberglass mass masts. They are military surplus. Uh, you'll still find them at Hamfest, but five, ten years ago, man, everybody had those things. They were going for a dollar a piece, two dollars a piece. Now they're not going to go for that low. And uh, the yellow thing on the end there is the is the guy plate, uh, stakes for the guy, and these black coils down here are the guys. Don't worry about the black coils up there. They're they're they're. We'll talk about those in a minute. But just for a single raised off the ground uh, 15 meter antenna, that's 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 the kit right there, and uh, it doesn't take doesn't take long to put it up. Uh, you put those pieces of aluminum together, and I've got a mark. You see the blue mark? I had to get a, get a quarter wave, and. Uh, If I was going to use it like that, I'd just I'd put a little tuner. I'd put the tuner right at the base of the, of the uh, antenna. Uh, both, uh, yes. <coughs> can you recommend an automatic tuner like you're talking about? Um, yes, I, yes, I can. I, I can recommend. <coughs> I have I have two different two different. I have a LDG, and LDG does not make anything but a 100 watt remote tuner anymore. They used to make a 600 watt, and I've got the 600 watt. But I guess they didn't have enough uh, call for it, so they didn't quit making it. I also have a 600 watt MFJ, which works very well, uh, because I like to run an amplifier. You know, when I go to field day, I don't go out there and make contacts. I don't really care. I'm not. Back in the old days, when I was first licensed, 60 years ago, <laughs> uh, field day was a time to go out in the field and prove that if we had to, we could communicate. So I didn't care about if, if <coughs> each contact was one point or two points. I was going to go out there and make sure I could communicate. So I had a little, I had a little 500 watt amplifier, and, uh, and that 600 watt tuner, remote tuner, worked well. And and the reason it reason does, <coughs> if you hang, if you hook a piece of coax to, to to that antenna right there, and run it 30 feet into a tent, and put your tuner in there, then you're gonna not only gonna tune the antenna, but you're gonna tune that piece of coax. So yeah, you, you got you got a tuned antenna. That's great, but you don't know what kind of pattern because that coax is going to radiate too. If you put the tuner at the base <coughs> of the antenna and run the feed line to the tuner, so all your then, then all your tuning is the antenna. You don't tune that coax. Yes. So a couple of questions. Um, the tuner you're talking about would be weatherproof. Yes. 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 Uh, again, model number. <laughs> no, I don't have it. But okay. if you got a MFJ catalog, all you got to do is put a remote antenna tuner, and it'll come up. Okay. Are there some that are more conducive to one model radio over another? No. no. Tuners, tuners, tuners don't care about the radio. Okay. They're going to take the signal from the radio in. Their internal uh, workings is going to do the tuning. To the antenna. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. Well, all they're looking for is an RF signal coming down that coax. Okay. It, 
could be a Heath Kidd, it could be a Collins, it could be a Yesu, Kenwood, doesn't make any difference. And all they're looking for is the, the RF signal coming down that core. And the nice thing about the uh, L, uh, LDG and the, the uh, uh, MFJ is they're, two, they're, they're powered by the coax. You have a little box on the inside that, that blocks the DC going back to your radio and it goes out, doesn't, doesn't do anything to the signal. And it actually powers the tuner from there. So it acts as a choke? No. No? No. It just provides power on the coax to power the tuner. So I'm saying the tuner acts as a choke? Do I right? um, Oh, the little box? Yeah, the little box acts as a DC choke so the DC does not go okay. back to the radio. I see what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. So, and that's that's a whole lot less stuff. Well, yeah, maybe it is, maybe it is. You can get some, well, I, I got a, a piece of coax string and stuff, all that. Well, when she's down looking, you got just about as much stuff to put up a dipole as you got to do this. And then you don't have to worry about whether you have supports for the dipole. Uh, just some more pictures of the, uh, and this is this is where coax goes, it just goes from the center over to the over to the aluminum. That's the feeds. And then you see the thumb screw down there at the bottom. That's where the that's where the radio go. <coughs> so are there spacing uh, angles between each other or distance? Uh, is that very critical? Are you talking about two like, like exactly ten degrees or thirty feet? Uh, yeah they there, there, there are, there are. We're going to get into the phasing part. That's uh, a little bit hard in the time I've got to. Uh, but you, you can put them as far apart as close together as you want. Ideally, ideally they should be a half a wavelength apart. Okay, and that half a wavelength does not necessarily have to be precise. In other words, if if a half a wavelength on on 15 meters is 23 feet, and you've got them 25 feet, uh, with these, if you put them up, if you put them up, uh, raised off the ground like this, you can you, It's going to be hard to get. So I just make I, the two two coaxes to go to the antenna the same length. It's all the it Doesn't really make any difference. You can you can. Well, we'll get into we'll get into how you can hook them up here in just a minute. But this just kind of gives you an idea of uh, all the stuff you got to have. It's it laid out, ready to go up. All right, come on. There's the antenna put together. There I put it up with the, with the guy ring. Uh, actually, that's. Uh, that's where the guy ring goes. It doesn't need that extra piece of pipe above it unless you're running 20 meters. And that's uh, that's the tensioner I showed you a while ago. Those were great. Uh, I, 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 I ended up buying, oh, probably I've got uh, 20 of them. And uh, on my 80 meter, I use three guys, so I use 12 of them on the 80 meter, and then I've got a set for the 15 and a set for uh, the uh, 20 meter if I need to, or the 40. And there it is on top of it, and that's with that piece of pipe that I, I got. To, I got to realizing that I've had four pieces of pipe with made 16 feet. Well, that's what I need for 20 meters. So I pulled one piece. I only need about 12 for 15. That's a better look at the guys. And the guys only have to go out about three feet, four feet. Okay. Now here's here's the diagram of, of what we're talking about when you when you run when you're running uh, uh, to. Uh, Two, anten two antennas, and you can see the pattern 
depending on how you feed it, how you feed that. Uh, if uh, if you feed it in the middle like this, this is the pattern you're going to get. Figure eight pattern. Okay, that's the two antennas. If you end feed it like this, then your pattern is like that. So just just uh, without facing anything into it, you could you could uh, change the direction of that antenna 90 degrees just by where you feed it. And you used to call it collinear. This is a vertical. That's what happens with collinear. You get that kind of pattern. That's why two meters back in the day when two meters was was coming on board, a collinear was the best antenna you could buy for the back of your car. It wasn't as long as a 102 inch width, but it was about maybe half that. <coughs> Now, you take a phase in feed and phase an antenna, this is the pattern you get. And you actually get 3 dB a gain. Okay? If I feed, and let's see, what am, I, what am I doing here? I'm feeding. And what happens is here is antenna 2, this is a quarter wave. This is a quarter wave stub line, okay? So when it's doing that, you got a quarter, a quarter wave stub in here. So uh, antenna two lags antenna one by 90 degrees, and that's what you get. That's the, that's the pattern. In other words, the signal comes out of antenna one first, and then the nine, and then. The, uh, combines with the signal coming out of this antenna to get that kind of pattern. That's the same way your uh, uh, Yagi antennas work, basically. Now if I change it, what I've done here is I've added a half wavelength piece of coax to that, so now I've changed it. I'm actually changing this, so now uh, antenna 1 lags from antenna two, so this is why this one, this signal comes out of it first, and then this one, so you get the pattern 90 degrees different. And you do the same thing here by feeding them in the middle, which is the way I feed them. And I have a, I didn't bring them, but I've got them. Uh, and when we get into phasing on, if we do phasing antennas on field day, I've got the boxes that actually with relays in it, but I can change, I can change that that line from there to here to change the change the direction. So I actually get I actually get 180. I can actually get 360 degrees uh, with the phased antenna. And that's a little more talks about it. Uh, you feed it here. See, that's half wavelength, half wavelength. It could be any. It can be any length. You get a broadside, which is uh, figure eight period. You put a half wavelength, you can get in fire this direction, 90 degrees, or you can do it, you see here you're changing the, that, the quarter wave stub to a different antenna. So that can get you, so that gets the other change. So, and here, here's that representation of what we're talking about. Well, you put two raised antennas, you notice whole multiple of an electrical half wavelength. Well, there's another another section here that says you can use any. It really doesn't make much difference. Uh, to get the to get the phasing part of it, you're going to put either a quarter wave phasing line in here or a quarter wave stub in that one, one or the other, and that's going to give you that that corridor pattern off the ends of the antenna. And this is came out of the book that I have. It's an old book. It's probably uh, it's, it's probably getting 40 years old. I actually bought it at Radio Shack, believe it or not. 
uh, and it gets me all the gets me all the dimensions. One thing you got to remember: the electrical uh, length of a coax or a wire is different than the RF length because all wire, coax, and everything has a velocity factor. So you see here, this is this one up here is uh, phase particles for dot 66 uh, velocity factor line, and this one down here is for dot 81. A dot 66 usually is uh, a solid dielectric, and the dot 81 has got the foam dielectric. So the, the velocity factor is different. So if you notice a quarter wavelength, ah, quarter wavelength for 15 meters at the dot 66 is 7 feet 8 inches. Down here on the dot 81, it's 9 feet 4 inches. So you got to be careful. You got to know what the velocity factor is of the coax that you're using. A half inch, half wavelength, half wave length, uh, length of coax, RF wise, the, the impedance is the same at both ends. Quarter wavelength, the impedance is, is less at the end than it is at the other. And that's how they use that half and quarter wave to uh, face and do things. It's, uh, and that's this, the, the characteristics of, of RF. And this is the type of patterns that you can get. You start out with no phase line in it, uh, with a half half wavelength spacing, you get that. When you put a quarter wave, you get this you get this pattern. And you can you know if you want to do five three eighths, these are different different patterns that you can get. You go and so you were talking about how far apart you can go. Well, you can see if you do an eighth. The pattern that's the pattern that you're going to get if you just use an eighth of a wavelength spacing. An well, eighth of a wavelength spacing is not but about four feet, so it's not not very much. <coughs> All right. Well, this is there, there's the 15 meter phasing lines, uh, and I did that with my with my. Uh, not, not the antenna. Anyway. I've got an RF Industries little, and it works great. And I'm actually down there. I put a connector on one end of it, and then I'm cutting quarter-inch pieces off of it until it registers the frequency and SWR that I want it to on there. And so what I did is I got I got both both of those 15-meter uh, phase lines within. Oh gosh! Yeah, you know, well, very close. Not exact, but I got them very close. They don't have to be exact. Uh, and that's a well, yeah, no, that's a 21 megahertz phasing. Uh, I mean, separation cable. Um, if I wanted just to put up a just put up a a uh, Pair of antennas without any phasing in it. I can just use that as separate, and that's a half wavelength. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure what that is. So oh, that's a separation. Yeah. Then I made some. It's still a half wavelength, but I cut them in half so that I could uh, feed them. Uh, and if I'm going to add phasing lines to it, here's the, here's the, here's my phasing switches. Uh, they both do the same thing, and it's a little different configuration. And all it is is a couple of relays. <coughs> the uh, antennas, antennas come in here and here. Okay, with the relays disengaged, they hook to the input, which is right here. I, I engage, I engage the uh, uh, one or the other of the. Uh, Relays, and what it does, it takes it, this would be the phasing phasing cable, so it would hook this to there, and this would hook right here in the middle. So 
So it would be there, so I'd throw the switch to another position, and I'd do the same thing over here. It would then hook up to this and to there, and that way I could go either either end the antenna or change that, make that pattern, and disengage, go to new, no, normal, and it's hooked together in the middle, give you the figure eight bit pattern this way. So that's uh, that's a little more than I was going to talk about tonight, but that's all right. Okay. Now, so what are we doing? Okay, we got about ten minutes. Uh, I've been asking. See if I can't cut it a little bit short so everybody can get down to meet on time. Not that they would, not that they would hold off starting the meeting ten minutes to get let them get. But that's okay. That's okay. All right, so as you can see, I have I have enough here to do a 15 meter antenna. Uh, I'm really not going to put all this together because then I just take it apart and that's what. Oops, wrong end. No. Yeah, I went looking for some of the, some more of these uh, rods on eBay, and what I bought for next to nothing years ago, the cheapest I found was sixty-five dollars. Mm. So if somebody figured out how how uh, good these are and what they're good for. All right, so there. This is a little bit longer than than uh, quarter wave on 15 meters. Okay, but I would use this as a, with a tuner, and the tuner will tune uh, an antenna that's longer than the desired frequency, then it will shorter. So this being a little longer than quarter wave on 15 meters is not a problem. And if I was going to use this, if you put my tuner, I would unscrew this. Well, tighten it up too tight. Anyway, and I would uh, screw coming on my tuner straight into that rather than than uh, through the coil. So this would then this would then. On here, I'm not screwing all this in all the way. So, oh, so there it is. And I would pre-tune this if I was going to use this on field day as it is. I would pre-tune it with my antenna analyzer before I ever got out. And so, in other words, my tap on that coil would already be in place. And all I'd have to do is just do a little quick check. And if I'm going to use an antenna tuner with it, I'm not even going to use the coil. And I can, you know, very easily if I wanted to, all I'd have to do is undo this U bolt and I can take that coil completely off and just use it like it is. So that's just, this is, uh, this would be something that's small enough. That if you wanted to, you could probably carry it around in your trunk of your car. Mm -hmm. And all, and that and uh, hand, that's not just army issue, right? The, 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 the antenna Do sections, I sections. That's all army issue. Used to be army issue. Uh, army issue. Army yes, issue. Yes. Yeah. RC two nine or two. Yeah. Uh, antenna is what it is. Uh, this came in a kit with mass. But it was actually, this antenna is designed, some of these are radials actually, off of the, uh, because the antenna that the RC-29 or 2, uh, you could make it anywhere from 
30, meg, uh, 30 mega cycles to about 70 or 80 mega cycles, depending upon what uh, what frequency that you were assigned. And just by adding, subtracting these these rods, then you can make the the uh, these are, these are set up so that they will, depending on how many rods you put in, will work on a particular band of frequencies. So, like I say, when I got them, I bought the whole RC-292 kit with the masks and everything, the guy wires, the whole business for less than 20 bucks. <laughs> and now, now, just these by themselves are about $70. I went looking the other day. And, uh, and they came with the guy wires. These are the guy wires. Right here. And, uh, these, uh, Tensioners. If I can get the get the string back through it, yeah, it goes right through. Come on, there it is. There it is. So you can pull it tight, but it won't pull this way until you pull this out, and it's coming right out. It's fantastic. And I think, uh, <laughs> can't think of the guy, we used to call him the wire guy at Hampest. He had all the wire. He sold those things. Not, they're prettier than those. They're nice and chromed and everything, but same principle. I don't know whether he still does or not. Uh, I tried to find some of those on, on uh, eBay, but couldn't find them. So that's what that's what we have for tonight. Any questions? You all know how to do it now, right? <laughs> I expect to see you. I expect to see you out of field day, and we'll we'll do some practical stuff. We'll we'll uh, if they, if if I get the if I get the okay, uh, we'll uh, uh, we'll put up we'll put up two phase. 15 meter antennas, and uh, we might put up the uh, we might put up the 80. That's a lot of hard work. A couple of you have been out. You were out there. You were out there, weren't you? When we put it up out the base, it's, it's it's it takes a little work to put the 80 put the 80 up. Takes a few guys. Huh? Yeah. And uh, uh, but we'll it. it the principle of all, all the principle on these is the same, no matter what it is. Ten meters. I've got a ten meter vertical too. I didn't bring it, but uh, I snapped off one of my two meter four forty eighteen footers antennas. It was up seventy feet on my tower, and the, so I, when that nice piece of fiberglass came down and stuck in the ground like a spear, I kept it, drilled a hole in the end, pulled my wire through it, made me a ten meter antenna out of it. So I've got a 10 meter vertical too. So uh, you got a question? Okay. Uh, but anyway, if, if they, if they, if they, uh, I should know tonight uh, if, if it's what, because I think the club gets an extra 100 points if they have a class, if I remember correctly. So uh, what time? Huh? What time? It'd be before lunch, probably about 11 o'clock, 10:30, 11 o'clock. Well, I haven't decided yet. I'd, Till I know what they want me to do, I won't make too much decision. Uh, you get more points if you have two antennas versus one. No, no. <laughs> With the class, they get a hundred extra points for having the class. Because that time we did it out the base, that's what we did. That was our class for us for the for our our submission that year. Uh, and um, I, I actually uh, put that eighty meter up couple of times we were doing field day over at the uh, uh, community center where they have the horse show in the trees so it's even if you're in the trees like that you can put a, a, a 50 foot vertical up you just got to be a little careful how you meander it around the limbs but you can get it up up there too 